So I'm very pleased that we have Dr. Lindsay Dutoy this week um, for our seminar series. Um, Dr. Dutoy is a vegetable seed um, pathologist and she has led the vegetable seed pathology program at the Mount Vernon Research and Extension Center since uh, 2000. And Dr. Dutoy is also the Alfred Christensen Distinguished Professor in Vegetable Seed Science and the um, just recently past president of the American Phytopathological Society. Or are you still, did it, it turned over, right, Lindsay? I'm the immediate past. <laughs> okay, immediate past. That means um, I still have to do some things. <laughs> okay. Um, and so she works all over the state and, um, and throughout the world. So we're very happy to have her this week to talk about fungicides. And I'll also say that today is Lindsay's birthday. So thank you, Lindsay, for presenting on your birthday. Um, so I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, appreciate the opportunity to take part in this series and, and hope that um, this uh, Lunch and Learn is of value to uh, some of those participating. Uh, the challenge when trying to cover a topic as complex as the use of fungicides in, in an hour, um, not uh, you know, including time for question and answers, is that the dilemma of how detailed do I get and how much um, to represent given the, the very um, complex things that can be covered. So I've attempted to approach this topic with some general information at the beginning about some principles that I think are really important to consider, and then to spend most of the time using case studies to illustrate those principles. And I think sometimes case studies help um, minutia stick better in our brains because we have something we can tether that, those details to. So hopefully this is um, useful to some of you. And I've tried to cover a range of examples. Uh, some may not be that relevant to your production situation. Some may be very relevant. Um, so hopefully something in this is of value to you. Um, let me see if I can um, get the page up. There we go. So just. Um, to note, because I will be mentioning pesticides in, in various forms through the presentation, um, it is your responsibility to follow the label. Um, if the label is the law, um, you need to follow the label and the requirements for your state and your production circumstances. And myself and WCU are not liable if you don't do so. So that's basically what this disclaimer is about. Um, and I think one of the really important components to effective use of fungicides, it's really foundational in disease management is to understand that the things that cause diseases in your crops are, can be very different. They're not all the same. Not all plant pathogens are the same. And I say this not to try and be condescending in any form or another, but um, we sometimes don't do a good job as plant pathologists and, and as extension folks in explaining the importance of this. But it's the same thing when you go to the doctor with a problem and it turns out it is infectious it's really important to know what it is that's causing the disease so that the correct prescription can be made. So we, because we're talking about fungicides, in essence, we're talking about prescriptions in some form or another of what you might use, whether you're organic or conventional, um, doesn't matter what uh, form they're all, uh, some type of prescription. And if you get the wrong prescription, you're wasting money, you're potentially putting a chemical out where it's not needed. And we, we all want to minimize the amount of pesticide use if possible because it's a cost and it's, um, these chemicals, you know, better not to use them if possible. So I had this picture taken from um, a wonderful text by Agrios on, on, on plant pathology that illustrates um, sort of a microscopic view of a plant cell that's kind of that rectangular type shaped structure in the background um, compared to the various types of organisms that can be pathogens of plants. And on the left-hand side, you see this list. And I, I have in gray font the fungi and oomycetes because they tend to historically have been grouped together as fungi. And yet they're extremely important, um, different groups and are closely related, but not the same. And we tend to refer to them using the same word and I'll explain why it is important. Um, the other um, very big group of organisms we see a lot in Western Washington, besides the fungi and the oomycetes, um, are the bacteria. And the reason that these three here, um, top three, are so prevalent, and certainly in Western Washington, is they're very uh, commonly driven by moisture. High humidity, uh, lots of periods of, of moisture on the canopy, and um, with the rains that are happening right now, if you're in Western Washington listening to this, this is classic. Uh, uh, moisture uh, drives these, these three groups in particular. But there are also very important other groups, such as phytoplasmas, um, 
uh, viruses, viroids, and nematodes. And I'll um, explain this in the picture. So this rectangular structure is a plant cell with a cell wall. And the biggest uh, feature here is the head of a nematode. So nematodes, for the most part, are soil dwelling. They're not true worms, but we kind of call them microscopic worms, but they're not actually true worms. And the plant parasitic ones have the structure in their head called a stylet. They, they stick in and out of the plant cell at rapid speed to break the cell structure and, and, and take up the contents of the plant cells. And that's how they do their damage. Um, and you can see this is just the head. So they're very, very big compared to the other types of plant pathogens. The structure down here called the, the, referred to as the fungus, it's multicellular. We often refer to it as mold or, or hyphae or mycelium that grows around the plant or in the cells. Um, and you compare that, because that's multicellular, you compare it with the bacterium here. And the bacterium is a single cell, and they usually have these whip-like structures, one or more attached to them that allow them to swim through a film of moisture on the plant. Um, phytoplasmas are very similar to bacteria, except they don't have a, a rigid wall around them, so they just have this membrane and they take this irregular type shape, so they can move very easily through the phloem, uh, through the phloem sieve tubes, uh, so they can get up and down the plant pretty easily. Because they don't have that wall, they can change shape and squeeze through these narrow spaces. And they're all transmitted by leaf hoppers. so there's a very, very unique aspect to phytoplasmas uh, in that they're, they're leaf hopper associated. In contrast to this, if you look at these tiny little dots here of different colors and, and these squiggle lines, these are all viruses that are very, very minute. Um, so you have ones that are flexuous rods, ones that are stiff rods, ones that are little circular structures, but they all basically consist of a piece of RNA or DNA surrounded by a protein shell. They, they're subcellular, some people don't even consider them alive because of that, and they rely on very unique mechanisms to either get around or to move through the plant. But you can see they're a tiny, tiny structure. You, you can't see them with the naked eye or even with most microscopes. And viroids, this is just those little few dots on the screen here. Those are even, even more minute because they basically don't even have the protein shell around them. They just consist of a piece of nucleic acid. And the, when it comes to the difference between fungi and oomycetes, this picture here doesn't necessarily tell you which one it is other than the fact that it has the label fungus. But all my seeds used to be considered fungi, but it's now very well known that all my seeds are more closely related to plants and algae. And the reason is their cell walls are made up of cellulose as opposed to true fungi, the cell walls are made up of chitin. And you might say, so what, who cares? Well, some fungicides are very specific in that they'll only attack, uh, have efficacy against all my seeds and others will only work against true fungi. So it's extremely important when selecting a fungicide to understand if it is effective against true fungi or it's effective against oomycetes, which are also known as water molds, because the ones that are typically effective against true fungi do not work against water molds and vice versa. And that's, even though we tend to use the word fungi to refer to both, that's an extremely important distinction that isn't always conveyed accurately. All right, so I'm going to illustrate this. Um, these three photos I put up here are photos I took of cabbage leaves, all three. The one on the left um, is a different disease from the one in the middle, which is a different disease from the one on the right. But they all are diseases we've seen here in Western Washington and many other places around the world. Um, they can be all uh, very important and they can all be controlled to some degree with various kinds of pesticides. So. I don't know if, if people want to chime in and tell me what they think these are. This might be hard to do question and answer in a virtual format, Deirdre, but um, maybe I'll just proceed and have, we have questions at the end that might be easiest. But if anyone wants to unmute themselves and chime in and tell me what they think these are, you're welcome to do that because that can make it more fun. Any, any brave volunteers out there? Wrong answers are welcome too because they get people thinking and realizing they're not the only one who might be wrong. <laughs> No, no brave souls out there. All right. Well, the one on the left is downy mildew on brassicas. It's caused by Peronospora parasitica, which is a water mold, an oomycete. seed. It is not a true fungus. So the types of fungicides you might use, if you are going to use fungicides to control downy mildew, are ones that need to be effective against oomycetes. seeds. In contrast, the middle picture is, is caused by, uh, is black rot. My screen actually blocking off the, the title, so I'm not sure if you can see it, Deirdre. The, it's black rot caused by the bacterium Xanthomonas campestris, pathobot campestris. So it's a bacterium. 
And the things that control bacteria are sometimes very different. Well, most of the fungicides don't, do not work against bacteria. So you really don't want to be using the wrong product against black rot. And the picture on the right is Alternaria black spot, which is caused by a true fungus, Alternaria basiculum. So if you wanted a prescription for treating these diseases, it's really important to know which one you have because you would use a very different product for each of these three diseases in cabbage. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to kind of, this slide is going to have a fair amount of text, um, but after we get through these slides, we'll get into sort of the more graphic and, and illustrative examples with case studies. It'll make it easier to follow. So bear with me on, on a, a sort of text dense slide. But I, I think it's really important to understand what it is that affects how well your applications might work. So obviously, you know by now that there are many different types of what we so lump together as fungicides. Think the true fungicides are ones that work specifically against fungi. But because we tend to refer to a lot of the water molds as fungi as well in, in common you know, lay language, that means we're often um, not distinguishing whether a fungicide works against or my seeds, uh, water molds, or if it works against true fungi, and that's an extremely important distinction. Ones that work against bacteria, we often refer to as bactericides, and yet, in general, in lay language and, and you know, common communication, we often just lump these all together as fungicides. Things that work against uh, ne uh, nematodes, we are often refer to as nematicides um, and viricides and so on. So understanding which group these belong to um, can be important, and the difficulty with this is very often the label will just say fungicide and not necessarily say bactericide or nematicide. So it's important to dig deeper into the label to understand which groups of organisms they might work against. And these classifications into these groups is really driven by the mode of action of the product. In the same way, when you get a prescription from a doctor uh, for an infection you might have, whether it's strep throat or, or something else, it, it, the prescription is based on the mode of action of that medicine to the target pathogen that's, you, that's affecting you. So you, there are lots of different modes of actions of fungicides. And if you have an opportunity to attend Dr. Tony Kynet's um, Lunch and Learn seminar next week, he will be getting into a lot more detail on this aspect of fungicides and fungicide modes of action and resistance. I'm not going to try to cover that because it's a, there's a large number of fungicides out there, but it's extremely important to recognize different modes of action have efficacy against different things. And part of this drives the spectrum of activity. So some fungicides um, act, are actually effective against a wide range of different pathogens, and others have a very narrow spectrum of pathogens that they control. And again, this is why it's important to do your homework about what to use. Unfortunately, one of the complications that comes with recommendations and often with a conflict of interest, is that I've seen many, many labels that will list organisms um, that, against which the product can be used that really aren't necessarily that effective against the, the organism. So you have to sometimes consult with someone who has experience with products to say, okay, these diseases are listed on these different products, but which ones are actually the best? Which are the modes of action that are actually best against these organisms? And that makes interpreting fungicide labels complicated because um, there's a benefit to claiming <laughs> efficacy, even if it's just very limited efficacy against an organism because a company can sell more. And that's, I think, a, a, a struggle we have in, in helping growers understand what really works best. Some very, very important components of understanding modes of action are the, how that translates to whether a product is, has contact activity. So you apply it and it sticks to the plant and it functions on the surface of the plant versus products that have any form of systemic activity. And when we say systemic, it means the product actually go, moves into the plant. And why is that beneficial? It's beneficial because products that are absorbed into the plant are not gonna be washed off because they're absorbed in. And usually when they're absorbed into the plant, there's some degree of movement of that product in the plant. So if you don't get quite as good a coverage as you might um, say in some circumstances or with a particular applicator you have or the product maybe doesn't spread as well or whatever it might be, systemic movement tends to relocate, retranslocate that product around the plant and you get better protection of parts of the plant. However, there are different degrees of systemic movement of products that do say systemic on the label. And this is really, really important. We're going to cover this repeatedly today and I want you to keep this in mind because just because the label says systemic 
does not mean it will move throughout the entire plant. That's an extremely important understanding. And the reason this, I think, is misunderstood so widely in agriculture is because for most of the insecticides and herbicides out there, when the label says systemic, they truly are very systemic and move almost throughout the plant. That's true for most insecticides and most herbicides. It's very, very different for fungicides. Most fungicides that have the word systemic on the label are only limited in terms of how much they move systemically through the plant. And I'll show you some illustrations on the next slide to get, get to this. But it's, if, you, if you learn nothing else from the seminar, this is probably one of the most important things to remember. Um, the mode of action also drives things like whether it's protected, it only allows uh, some protection against incoming inoculum or whether it has any curative activity. We tend to recommend and, and growers tend to use fungicides as if they all have curative activity. You see a disease starting to show up in your crop, you say, I better apply something so I can kill the infection. Very few fungicides have effective curative activity. What they do when you apply them, if you've got disease already in your crop, is they limit further development of the pathogen and they limit further development of the disease. But they very, very few of them will actually cure existing infection. And that's, that's important to note because that helps explain sometimes why you, it's difficult to put a disease in its track, stop it in its tracks once things get going. The efficacy of your applications are also very, very strongly influenced by a wide range of things related to how you apply it. So when you apply a product, if you apply it at the wrong time, um, it may be registered for use against that particular disease on that particular crop. But if you apply it at a time when the, the, the pathogen's not there or the pathogen's in a form that it's not susceptible to that application, you may be wasting your time, even though it is the right product for that crop and that disease. One of the most important aspects of how you use these fungicides is, do you get good coverage? And this comes back to this question about whether it's contact or systemic and how systemic is the product. So if it has very limited systemic movement or no systemic movement, it's purely contact, and you don't get good coverage of the canopy, because say it's a very tall crop, a very dense canopy, and you put it on with a low gallons per acre, a low volume of water, it's not going to get down into the bottom of the canopy where you have high humidity and the highest risk of these pathogens establishing and colonizing and reproducing. So the volume of, of water or carrier you use to apply something, also if you're doing say air blast spray at an orchard, that air and the blasting forces the product into the canopy to get better coverage. The pressure that you use of your sprayer um, in terms of the, the movement of those of droplets uh, the rate of so, you know the method of application, whether it's a spray boom or whether it's through your irrigation system, all of these have a big, big impact on coverage. And coverage is important to get the best out of your product. The rate of application of a product is really important. Um, when you look at the label, it'll say you can apply this product at rates from you know say 0 0.2 pounds per acre to 0 0.5 pounds per acre, and you, you have that leeway to go within that rate. The difficulty there is that lower rates tend to result in lower efficacy. Um, and if you have very limited disease, perhaps that's okay. But I'll, I'll mention something coming up shortly about why I almost never recommend to growers to use anything but the maximum labeled rate. And the reason is fungicide resistance. We'll talk about this some more. Another thing that can really influence the efficacy of application is whether or not you use what, we, what I lump together as adjuvants, so things like stickers and spreaders. If you're putting a fungicide on a crop that has a very waxy leaf, like onions or cabbage, um, some products tend to just roll off the leaf. So you end up wasting that product if you don't use the correct adjuvant. Some products come with their own built-in adjuvant, like Bravo Weather Stick. Weather Stick is in the product name because it's, it's formulated so that it will stick well to, to surfaces. So really, really important to read the label and understand whether you should or shouldn't apply some kind of spreader or sticker um, adjuvant of some kind to the product. You want to be really careful because sometimes adjuvants can make products phytotoxic. They can lead to a toxicity to the host and that can vary widely across plant species. We know plants like spinach tend to be very sensitive to most chemicals and you have to be really careful about not putting an adjuvant in with some most fungicides on spinach because you can get phytotoxicity. Others are more hardy and so really understanding the risks and the need for adjuvants is extremely important. The efficacy is also influenced by where that pathogen is originating. Is the inoculum in the soil? Is it flying in the air, but through the wind or through the rain being blown around? 
all of that can influence um, how and where you should be applying the product. And we'll go through this in case studies. The environmental conditions can also have a big influence. If you have conditions extremely conducive to a particular disease, and this year is a classic example, we had very extended wet cool spring. It didn't stop raining until into July and temperatures were quite cool. So I saw some folio diseases in a number of crops uh, much more severe than I normally see in Western Washington um, in the spring because it stayed cool and wet for so long. So even though growers are using products to try and control these diseases, it's hard to fight the system when you, the conditions are that conducive for, for these diseases. So then you might need to consider either increasing the number of applications or looking at other things related to that uh, first bullet point under efficacy is also influenced by to see if you can get the most out of your individual applications. I just want to touch on this briefly, but I know Tony Kynes is going to get into this in much more detail next week about managing the risk of fungicide resistance. Many of these fungicides that um, you, you use um, come with a risk of fungicide resistance. And this is particularly driven by modes of action. And the risk of this is so great that all the companies that manufacture and sell fungicides have come together and formed what is called the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, or FRAC. Because when products um, lose their efficacy as a result of pathogens developing resistance, the product's no longer worth anything. So the companies have a vested interest in keeping that shelf life of their products by helping growers manage for resistance. Growers also don't want to lose products because of resistance because it's, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get a product registered. Um, and, and rightly so, there's a lot of constraints on getting products registered. You need lots of safety and efficacy and other data to be, and, and residue data to be generated. And so it doesn't happen very easy that you can quickly get a replacement if a product becomes ineffective because of resistance. So fungicides are all assigned into these groups called FRAC groups based on the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. And these FRAC groups are all based on their modes of action. So it's take, taking it back to how these products actually work against the pathogens. So in order to reduce the risk of fungicide resistance, if you do use fungicides, mechanical, conventional, it's really important to not keep relying heavily on one product or one mode of action. It's extremely important that if you use making multiple applications that you rotate products with different modes of action, but they still need to be products that work against the target organisms that you're encountering or you're concerned about in your field. Or you can tank mix them. There are some fungicides in, 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 in frac groups that have a very wide method that uh, multiple ways in which they inhibit fungi or kill fungi. And those products we call broad spectrum mode of action. They have multiple ways that they're impacting the pathogen and there's very little to no risk of resistance because there's so many mechanisms by which the fungus would have to overcome um, that, that pesticide in order to be resistant. So there are thankfully some FRAC groups for which there's never ever been recorded resistance. And those multi-site types of products, uh, things like uh, sulfurs, things like um, the products like chlorothalonil or Bravo or Mancozeb, they, they, there's no known resistance. So they are very important for rotations and for tank mixing, if appropriate, for specific diseases. Um, extremely important way to try and reduce that risk. And this brings me back to this comment about why I almost never recommend to a grower to use anything below the maximum labeled rate is because when you use reduced rates of application for these fungicides and frac groups that have a very high risk, you increase that risk of resistance. Similar to if you get a prescription from the doctor of an antibiotic and you decide after a week, oh, I'm feeling fine, I'm not going to finish my course of antibiotics. And that we know, we all know, if you pay attention, that is one of the highest risks of increasing the development of resistance to antibiotics used in human medicine. It's extremely important to finish your course of antibiotics if you start. And using reduced rates of application of fungicides has a very, very similar impact. And so I, I know that growers would prefer to be able to use a reduced rate because you it costs less money, but it comes with a very high risk for products that have um, a very site-specific mode of action with a great risk of resistance. So this is, there's a lot packed in the slide, and I put a link at the bottom to the Pacific Northwest Disease Management Handbook. Um, it has a wonderful set of articles on pesticides, um, covering much, uh, much, much more than I was able to cram into this slide. 
Um, so if you have the time, I really encourage you to go to that website, look for the pesticide section and skim over the various components in those articles. And that will really help you get into more um, the in-depth uh, assessment of these various components that impact how well your fungicide program might work. So let's get to some illustrations that might help you understand this extremely important aspect of how systemic a fungicide is or isn't. So within the groups that might ha that have the word systemic on the label, there's three categories of systemic activity of products within a plant. The first one, which has the least degree of movement in a plant, is called translamina. So if you apply a product and it lands on the top of a leaf, because you know sometimes it's hard to get the spray to get to the underside of the leaf, if it lands on the top of a leaf and a product is translamina, it's moved across the leaf blade. So it'll move from the top surface of the leaf to the bottom and across that blade, but it won't move into adjacent leaves. It won't move down the plant, it won't move up the plant. So these are translamina. Products that are locally systemic, um, will move to a limited degree in the plant. They move through the xylem, okay? And xylem is what moves water through the plant. And xylem basically takes water from the soil where the roots have taken it up and it moves the water up the plant in one direction only. So xylem does not move water down, it only moves water up. So products that have local systemic activity, that pr those products are only gonna move in the direction that water moves in the plant. So this is extremely important. If you're applying a product that you think is going to help control a disease in the soil on your roots and you apply it to the canopy and it's locally systemic, it will not move down to the roots. It'll not move down to protect those potato tubers in the ground or the roots against you know, soil-borne fungus. It'll only move up away from the site um, towards the tips of the leaves. Products that are fully systemic, um, they, they divide it into two groups again. And you see I have a red arrow and a black arrow. The black arrow is the direction of products that move in the xylem. So products that are fully systemic that move in the xylem, for example, if you apply them to the soil and the roots take them up, the plant will actually move those products throughout the entire plant, all the way up to the leaves. So they truly are fully systemic, but only in one direction. The products that move in both directions, which is indicated by the red arrow in this figure, they move in the phloem. And phloem is the vascular tissue that the plant uses to translocate photosynthates. So the leaves you know, produce photosynthates and they would get relocated around to, to the root to make a storage carrot or you know, to help the plant grow. So phloem will move things in both directions. So phloem translocated fungicides move in both directions. So you would think, well, ideally, all of our products should be phloem translocated in order to get the maximum benefit because if you apply it to the foliage of a potato plant and it's phloem translocated, it'll actually go down and protect the developing tubers and the roots and so on. But ones that are xylem translocated won't do that. Now, so here I brought up some wording at the bottom that this is a really, really important principle about systemic fungicides. So ones that are xylem translocated only move up. And one of those examples is, for example, Ritamil or Metalaxyl Mephanoxum, and it's in FRAC group four. And it works against oomyces only against oomycetes, it's not true, not true fungi. And it'll actually move fully systemic, so it'll be taken up by the roots and be able to translocate upwards throughout the entire plant, but only upwards. An example of a phloem translocated fungicide that moves both up and down is aliet or a phosphorus acid, which is in frac group 33, and it's indicated by this red arrow, it'll move down, up and down. And this is the only group of fungicides that has phloem translocation. It's very, very different from most insecticides and herbicides that say systemic on the label are phloem translocated, but almost, with the exception of this one group, almost none of the others is phloem translocated. So it's really important to understand that and how you might, might use these products. Any product that is not systemic, not translaminar, not locally or fully systemic is contact, you will not get it taken up into the plant. It will not move around the plant. So coverage becomes that much more critical when you're dealing with, with these kinds of products. Very, very important. Just to illustrate this, um, this is a slide, uh, a picture I took off the APS website, the American Phytopathological Society website. There's an article written by Paul Vincelli at the University of Kentucky. And he uses this to illustrate, he has a, a leaf with a drop in, represented by this blue dome, a drop of water carrying the fungicide trifloxystrobin. So trifloxystrobin is in the strobilurin family, which is frac group 11. 
very, very widely used in conventional agriculture. It's not approved for organic use. But if you look at how uh, trifloxystrobin moves in a plant, so if a drop lands on the leaf, the first form of, of redistribution is on the surface, represented by those blue arrows. So trifloxystrobin is redistributed on the surface of the plant. In this case, he says it's a turf grass plant. There's also some penetration of the waxy cuticle. So trifloxystrobin has a very high affinity for the plant surface and absorbed into the waxy layers of the plant. Some products don't have that high affinity for waxes and that's where it becomes really important to use adjuvants, stickers and spreaders. The strobilurins also have translaminar activity represented by this red arrow where it'll actually penetrate through the surface of the epidermis of the leaf and move across the blade, but will not enter the vascular system. So you aren't gonna get any movement from where that drop lands down the leaf, um, back, back down the leaf, um, because it's not translocated in any form and it won't actually move to the tip of the leaf if the, if the drop and lands in the middle of the leaf blade. And for some fungicides like this particular one, there's also what we call a vapor phase redistribution. When the droplets land on the leaf, there's some kind of vaporization of some of those droplets and you get that uh, vapor movement and reabsorption. Um, many fungicides do not have that. So this just illustrates the complexity of, of ways that products do or don't get onto and into plants and, and really, really important to understand. So this particular product does not get into the vascular tissue whatsoever. I've listed um, a number of resources here that I hope will help you if you want to pursue um, further details on any of these issues. So the Pacific Northwest Disease Management Handbook I mentioned, there's a whole section on pesticides, APS Education Center, um, there's a wonderful, fairly easy to understand section on fungicides, it gets quite detailed, it starts pretty basic and get quite detailed. If you want to look at the Fungicides Resistance Action Committee website, the TRAC website, it also gives a lot of specifics about which products have highest risks and ways that you can manage that risk. Uh, Washington State University has a pest management resource service that's extremely valuable with all aspects related to um, pest management and pest, pesticide use. It also has a link within that website to the Pesticide Information Center online, which we like to call PICKLE. And this pickle website is extremely valuable if you want to know what product is registered for use on your crop in your state. And this pickle website is only for Washington and Oregon. So I apologize to those listening who are not from those two states. But you can go onto this website, enter what state you're in, enter what crop it is you're looking at, enter either the disease or the product or the trade name or the active ingredient, and it'll come up with a list of things that are registered um, for that state, for that crop, uh, and tell you what. Um, diseases or pests or insects or weeds are, are available for use um, on that crop and, and, and approved legally. So an extremely useful website, very easy to use, um, and I hope many of you, if you're not familiar with it, will take a look at it. It includes organic products. So all of these resources are relevant for both organic and conventional um, use of fungicides. The Environmental Protection Agency has a, a very uh, valuable biopesticides website listed on this uh, slide. The Organic Materials Review Institute has a lot of information for those who are in certified organic production and want to know more. Uh, Purdue University, for people who want to know a little bit more about this issue of fungicide mobility in and on plants, um, Jana Beckerman from Purdue University wrote a very nice three-page um, extension article on fungicide mobility. It's geared towards um, ornamentals and landscaping and nursery and greenhouse industries, but the principles are relevant across the board. So I hope these uh, sites will be of value to you if you want more details. So I'm gonna go through some case studies here um, to help drive home some important principles that we've just covered. And these might make it more, more relevant and easy to remember some of this. So this is a picture I took in a spinach seed crop here in uh, Western Washington. Um, it's a hybrid seed crop um, with male and female lines. This is a dioecious species, so separate male and female plants. And the broad areas of dying plants, um, that, that's not just natural senescence, those are plants that are dying because of the disease. And this is a photo that uh, Alex Batson, the student in my program, took a um, beautiful photo showing these symptoms on the roots. Okay, and you can see healthy roots should be that nice white to pink color. And you can see some very blackened roots that illustrate very nicely how the fungus from the soil moves into the root hairs and into the roots and gets into the basket tissue and then moves up into the main tap root and up the plant. 
right? So this is Fusarium wilt in spinach seed crops. And if you think you have this disease in your field or you think it might develop or you start seeing symptoms of it, what can you do in terms of fungicides? Are there fungicides you can use or not? And what should you use? How should you use them? When should you use them? So these are really important questions to ask yourself. You, you can go to an extension related person or your local dealer and say, what should I use? And they might give you a recommendation. But I think it's really want folks to start thinking about this in terms of the principles we've just covered. So this is caused by, this disease is caused by Fusarium oxysperum and a particular strain that goes to spinach, Formus fistulus spinacea. Is it a fungus or is it an OMI seed, a water mold? Very, very important question. I, I've kind of been talking about it as a fungus, so you know it's not a bacterium or a virus or a nematode, but it's important to know if it's a true fungus or if it's a water mold. This happens to be a true fungus, not a water mold. So you would never want to use a product like Ritamil or Aliette, which only work against water molds. They do not work against Fusarium. And, I, and it may seem like an obvious one, but I've run into situations over and over again where a farmer has called me up and said, he or she received a recommendation from a dealer to apply this particular product against this particular disease that, that they're dealing with. And I had to kind of take a step back and say, now why did they make that recommendation? Because that product worked against water molds and this disease you're talking about is not a water mold. It would have no efficacy whatsoever against this. So I've run into situations where dealers are making a recommendation on the wrong products based on the lack of understanding of a true fungus versus a water mold. So knowing this is a true fungus, are there any fungicides that work against Fusarium wilt on spinach? Um, and when should you apply it? I mentioned that the inoculum is in the soil. So what happens if you start seeing symptoms show up in your crop? Like this particular grower brought this to our attention in, I think it was late June. If you put a fungicide on at that point, is it going to work? Is the fungus in the leaves, in the foliage? The fungus is in the soil, in the roots, and in the crown, and moves up into the basket tissue, but it's not in the leaves. So, if, and, and if you apply fungicides that might work against Fusarium, and they are frac groups uh, one and three that we know work against fungi like Fusarium, are those xylem translocated or are they phloem translocated? So if you try and apply a product like the frac groups one and three to a spinach crop after it's showing symptoms and you apply it to the foliage, those are only tra xylem translocated or contacts. They're not phloem translocated. They will not move down into the crown, into the roots. They will give you zero protection against this fungus in the soil and the roots and the xylem of your plant because those products will not move down. They're xylem translocated. So it is too late to try and control a disease like Fusarium wilt with fungicides uh, when the symptoms are already showing in the crop. It is too late. You will get no efficacy. You'll be spending money and putting out product unnecessarily. So you really need to put it on either pre-plant or at planting or drench it shortly after planting. So you get that product down into the soil where the roots are going to encounter it and take it up and move it up. It, it doesn't work to apply it and think it's going to be moved down the plant into the roots because all the products that have any efficacy against Fusarium are xylem translocated or contact. They will not move down in the phloem. So you need to put it in the soil and you need to get into the soil as best you can. And how do you do that? Um, you can, you know, put it on as a drench and incorporate it. You can put it as a pre-plant uh, drench and incorporate it. You can put it in the furrow with the seed at planting if your equipment is set up that way. You can band it over the row uh, fairly at, at just after planting or shortly after planting. But this is where it becomes really important to get as high a volume of water as possible. Why is that? Because you need that product moved down into the soil profile. Roots don't grow up to the soil surface. They grow down into the soil in, in search of water. And so you need to be able to move that product down. And the complication here is that some fungicides bind very tightly to organic matter and soil. And so those products don't move down the soil profile, even if you put a lot of water on. So understanding the mobility of fungicides in soil, which is very different than mobility in the plant, also becomes important when you start to look at where a product should be used. So you can see how it gets complicated really quickly. And we did a series of trials trying to see if there were any fungicides that might work against Fusarium wilt and spinach. And this is a picture of Mike doing some applications of the fungicide proline. We looked at fungicides in frac groups one and three, so Topsin and Mertect and proline uh, to see if, because they are known to control 
various fusarium pathogens to see if they might work. And note that they both have, all three have locally systemic activity, um, so very limited movement. The first two um, are registered for use on spinach seed for seed production. And proline um, is registered for use at planting or shortly after planting. Ideally, should be drenched. Um, we used a backpack sprayer, which really doesn't give nearly the volume of water that you want to get it into the soil profile. But using it in this manner, we were able to show that we could get a limited reduction in disease. So this shows three different inbreds of spinach, susceptible, moderate, and partially resistant to fusarium wilt. And the severity of wilt is on the uh, y-axis on the left-hand figure. When you applied proline, you got a small reduction in the severity of the disease, which ultimately, when you look at seed yield at the end of the season, did translate to a significant increase of um, marketable seed yield by 11 to 18 percent for the inbreds that were more susceptible to the disease and negligible uh, increase in the, the partially resistant parents. So you should never rely on fungicides to control a disease as devastating as fusarium wilt um, with the fact that it's very hard to get a product into that soil profile. By the time you see symptoms, it's too late because you're not going to get that product moved down into the root zone, um, which can extend down to a foot or more in the soil profile. So another case study. Um, those of you who work with potatoes, um, you've probably seen um, or encountered or heard about Pythium leak, which is caused by Pythium ultimum, and Pink Rot, which is caused by Phytophthora erythroseptica. Both of these pathogens are water molds or oomycetes. They are not true fungi. So you would never want to use the type of product you might use for a disease like fusarium wilt. Um, and so it's important to understand what the disease is, get an accurate identification of the disease to understand which products might work and where to apply them and how to apply them. Fortunately for oomycetes, you have the, the one group of products that is truly form translocated, that's products like Elliot or the phosphorus acids, and they will actually move down and protect the developing tubers. But if you apply Ritamil to your canopy, thinking it's going to move down from the leaves into the tubers that are developing, it's not going to happen because Ritamil is xylem translocated. It's fully systemic, but only in one direction. It won't go down, it'll only go up. So you can't use Ritamil in, on mature potato crop to control these diseases in the tubers that are developing because it won't get down to those tubers. Another example is Rhizoctonia, another classic example of soil-borne disease that attacks many, attacks many different species. So here on the left is a potato stem with Rhizoctonia lesion. In the middle are pea plants with Rhizoctonia lesions all over them. On the right is a spinach plant with Rhizoctonia lesion. And this is a soil-dwelling um, root pathogen of many, many species. And so you again have to ask yourself, what do you apply? This is a true fungus, not a water mold. So things like Ritamol and Elliot will not work. Where do you apply it? It's in the soil, the pathogens in the soil. So you need to get this pro these products down into the soil, into that rooting zone. And that impacts when and how you might apply them in order to get them there where the roots are growing and developing and not um, you know, well into the season when everything has emerged. And just to give you an illustration, this is a picture of these patches in an onion crop showing uh, fairly severe patches of stunted plants caused by Rhizoctonia. And we did a series of trials looking at a number of fungicides. Um, we looked at others, some biologicals as well, but uh, basically quadrus, um, when it's applied as a pre-plant incorporated product over the bed and then incorporated into the bed pre-plant, we did get a very significant reduction in the severity of the stunting, the number of patches and the severity of those patches. Um, in another trial here, you can see the degree to which quadrus reduced the severity and a, this, a number of those patches. Um, and I'm going to switch to a different example here um, of bacterial disease, just to switch to a whole different category of pathogen. So here we have two different bacterial diseases um, of vegetables that we work with and, and have had to help growers with. Uh, one is black rot of kale. It's caused by Xanthomonas campestris, Pathobacter campestris. And it is a very, very serious pathogen. It's a quarantine disease in um, six parts of six counties in Western Washington because it's extremely explosive. It, it breaks out under our conditions where we can get a lot of rain. Um, and on the right is the disease of chard and beets called, called um, bacterial leaf spot that's caused by Pseudomonas syringi, um, a particular strain called Aptarda that goes to these hosts. 
how do you control bacterial diseases like this? Well, um, the difficulty with bacterial diseases is we do not have any systemic bactericides. So there aren't any that are going to be taken up the plant and translocated either through the xylem or the phloem to give you protection against these bacterial diseases. The most effective bactericides currently available across the board are the coppers, and they are organic coppers like Nordox and others, and they are synthetic coppers. However, coppers are purely protective. And so I'm going to give you some examples to illustrate this, and it's a really powerful example. We worked with a disease uh, called bacterial leaf blight on carrots, and we ran a trial with a number of different products to see if we could control this disease in carrot seed production because this bacterium gets onto the seed and becomes a big problem if you're selling seed or buying seed. And you can see here a list of various uh, treatments we used. We looked at a number of compost teas, we looked at uh, chlorine, we looked at Actigod, which induces a systemic resistance response. We looked at two types of coppers, coside and mancoside. And this is a log scale. This amount of xanthomonas we picked up on the seed after harvest of the seed from these plots. And all these bars are high, so nothing was very, very effective. But the most effective product was mancoside or, or coside, the three coppers. And most of these products were put on by a spray boom. Um, but when we put on mancoside by chemigation, so we injected it through the sprinkler into the plots, we got better control than when we put mancoside on through a spray boom. And why is that? It's because of coverage. The large volume of water in a sprinkler that's running over a field um, carries that copper down into the canopy where the humidity is higher and the pathogen is building much more rapidly. And so you can see how coverage makes a huge difference. Still don't get complete control, but recognize this is a log scale. So the difference between a five and a six here on the, on the y-axis is a tenfold difference in the amount of bacteria we, we recovered on the seed. But again, you're not gonna, it's not a silver bullet, it's not gonna completely control this, but coverage with products like coppers, because they're contacts, not systemic, becomes extremely important. I also wanna show you um, some results we, we got from a greenhouse trial that really illustrate the purely protective nature of coppers. So we inoculated carrots in the greenhouse with xanthomonas, either before or after applying mancocyte. This is a copper, okay? So you can see um, the, the uh, orange bar that runs from you know, just under 0 0.5, two weeks after inoculation of the bacterium, up to just under one after five weeks, shows that if we don't put any copper in the plants, this is how the bacterium will develop on the, on the plants. This is severity of the disease. If we apply copper prior to applying the bacterium to the plants, so that's the brown bar, you can see the big drop in the severity of the disease from the orange line to the brown line. So that shows the degree to which copper works. If you put it on and then the bacterium gets on the plant, it does help protect and limit the amount of disease development. If you put on copper both before you apply the bacterium and afterwards, that's the black bar. So it doesn't add too much more when you uh, put it on before you, the bacterium lands on the plant and after. But what happens if you, the, plant gets infected with xanthomonas, and then you try applying mancoside because you suddenly see the disease. That's represented by the red line here. And this is pretty astounding. It shows you that if you put mancoside on after the bacterium is well colonized on the leaves, you actually get worse disease. And you would say, well, why, how, how can that be the case? Look at that red line versus the orange line. Part of this is coppers are pretty indiscriminate. They work against a wide range of organisms. They call, control bacteria. They also help control fungi. Yeah, coppers are toxic to fungi and bacteria. So you're killing off other things that are on the surface of the leaf that might compete with the xanthomonas, and the xanthomonas has more of a heyday once it gets going. So it really illustrates an important principle that coppers are protective, not curative. And that makes it extremely challenging to try and control bacterial diseases with, with coppers. I'm going to slip through the slide just for the interest of time um, because we have got other examples I want to get through. Um, but these are some photos for another case study of leaf spots on spinach, which can be a problem in our cool, wet climate. Most of these pathogens, um, like these leaf spot fungi, do very well in cool conditions. Um, when I first started this job um, 20 years ago, the growers wanted products that were more effective against uh, these leaf spot pathogens because they can all be carried on the seed. And so we tested a whole range of products listed here. I don't have to worry about the details. But basically, we found a number of products towards the bottom of this table that were more effective. They're in that FRAC group 11 um, that was mentioned earlier, the strobilurin family that Firefox is in. 
they were in that family, they were more effective than what the growers were able to use, which was Bravo and Dithane. Those are broad spectrum, broad mode of action. They work against a wide range of fungi. They have no risk of resistance, but they're not as strong as these other groups like FRAC11. So that looked great. We helped the growers um, find better products that could keep their crop clean and limit the risk of those seed becoming infected. Because if you sell that seed infected, you're now distributing the pathogen with the seed. What we did show very clearly is that for one of these fungi, Stemphilium, if there's pollen present on the plant, the amount of disease is much more severe. So here you can see when we inoculate the plants without pollen in the inoculum or with pollen, um, when you put Stemphilium with that pollen, you got five times the amount of disease, uh, three times the amount of disease on the plants. Very, very severe. And this effect happened whether we inoculated young plants or mature female plants. When we added pollen, the disease was much worse. So it really helped us work with growers to understand the key time for applying fungicides, if you need to apply them to control these diseases, is just before the, plants, the crop starts to shed pollen. And growers don't want to apply more fungicides than they need to. So this is one of the critical timing for fungicide application. If you have very dry weather, when, fund, when the pollination is starting, you don't even need to spray it because uh, under very dry conditions, these diseases can't establish. But if you have wet weather and you're getting very close to pollen shed, this is a key time to put on the fungicide application. So you can limit how many applications you might need to use if you understand the importance of timing and getting the best bang for your buck for that application. Um, unfortunately, in the last few years, um, we've discovered, and this is through work of another student in my program, Kayla Sporton, that there are actually a number of different stemphilium species that are causing leaf spot on spinach. And this just show um, the two different species growing in petri plates and symptoms on the leaves. And Kayla um, Sporton has shown that we have um, two, these two different pathogens uh, differ quite significantly in which species of, um, which cultivars of spinach are susceptible. And this is important to know because you can see here when she inoculated all these cultivars, some of them have names, some just have letters because we weren't told what they were. With one species, some of the cultivars are completely resistant. You get no disease at all. And others are highly susceptible. So for example, hammerhead, kookaburra, platypus were extremely susceptible to the one species. All of them got infected when we inoculated with the other species, but to a limited degree compared to the first species. So, Kayla showed that in some cases, if you have in an area where you have problems with this disease, you could um, avoid the need for applying fungicides altogether by growing one of these varieties that's completely resistant to the one species. But if you have the other species present, um, you can still get disease. And the other thing that Kayla, oops, for some reason my slide's not moving. The other thing that Kayla showed is that Unfortunately, um, isolates of that first species, the one that uh, can cause very severe disease on varieties like hammerhead and platypus, all of those isolates are highly resistant to the fungicides in FRAC group 11, those strobilurins that previously, when I started this job 20 years ago, we showed were highly effective against the original species we saw in the crop. And so this has raised very serious concerns for growers who've been struggling to control this disease, particularly in states like Texas and Florida, where they have a lot of humidity, warm conditions that, and, and moisture that favor this. They've been having increasing difficulty controlling this disease. And Kayla showed that it's because um, the strain, the species that they're dealing with is resistant to the main group of fungicides they've relied on. It really shows the importance of not dominating your fungicide program with just one mode of action. Okay, I'm going to skip through this, uh, Deirdre, because of time. I want to leave time for a few questions. Um, so, so I apologize to folks. I'm going to move. I had too, way too many case studies in here. And then I'm going to go to the wrap up <laughs> and just say, you know, fungicides should not be used alone when you're controlling diseases. They're part of an integrated management program. It's really important to monitor and scout your crops to understand if you have applied pesticides, how well have they worked? Um, are they effective at all? Are you wasting your money? I often ask growers um, when they're not sure if a product worked, did you leave a little, a few plants or a strip in your field that you didn't spray to see if it even worked or you're just spending money and feeling better about it because you put something out? Um, oops, sorry, because it keeps stopping. These need to be integrated with the use of cultural practices, which can often be even more effective than fungicides. Um, the use of resistant or tolerant cultivars if they're available. And really important is to know what it is you're trying to control. So getting an accurate diagnosis to understand what it is, 
when it comes in, how it survives, when is it at the most vulnerable stage for your product, your applications to be effective. And you can only really use your tools effectively when you understand, understand that. So with that, um, if there's time, Deirdre, I'll be happy to try and answer some questions. And I know you have some quiz questions you have to present. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, we will, um, I'll launch a poll right now. Um, so if you, for everyone, but also particularly if you are um, getting the pesticide credits, this is a required aspect. And also if people have questions, you can put them in the chat box. So I'll launch this um, quiz. It's four questions, so be sure to scroll down. Um, and we'll give people a, a couple minutes and um, also a chance to put their questions in the chat box. So thank you very much, Lindsay, for that presentation. That was extremely informative. I see answers starting to come in. getting a good number coming through here so i'll just wait a few more minutes or seconds rather sorry <laughs> um in the meantime i have a question that's come in so i will ask that um could you talk a little bit more about the circumstances under which applying a broad spectrum product could worsen the disease um, and maybe a couple of other uh, disease crop examples Sure. So um, we've seen this um, in particular, and it was one of the um, sorry case studies I kind of skipped over because of lack of time. But we've seen this in particular when it came to um, looking at control of bacterial blight in carrots. So as I mentioned, it's a, it's a bacterium, and um, coppers have traditionally been used. And I was asked to write a letter to support registration of a fungicide for controlling bacterial blight in carrots. And I was rather intrigued about why I would want to write a letter for a fungicide to control a bacterium. And so uh, when I looked at the data that were generated uh, for the study, um, it was really clear that you couldn't tell if the fungicide truly worked. You had some plots with no disease at all, but it was, it was just background noise. It was very highly variable data, disease in the field. And so we did some trials in the greenhouse to try and could look at this more carefully and, and generate data that we could have confidence if this product worked. And so we put on this fungicide, which has a very, it had two modes of action. So it controlled a wide range of fungi with and without the coppers and we inoculated. And what we found is when we used this broad spectrum product that had multiple ingredients in it to, to control fungi and then apply xanthomonas, we actually got way worse disease than if we'd not used the, the fungicide at all because we were killing off all the competitors. Uh, you know, the, the surface of leaves, they're not sterile. There's a lot of microbes interacting on in that surface of the leaf and colonizing that leaf. And they're competing and they're competing for resources and space and, and antagonizing each other. And, and for some pathogens, that can be really important in limiting the capacity to colonize and establish on the pond, and particularly with many of these bacteria. And so we showed that the use of things like TANOS, this is particular fungus we're looking at, to try and control bacterial diseases on carrots can actually make those diseases worse than if you use the correct product. So that's one example. It re really was very, very distinct. And so, of course, I did not support the registration and the company agreed not to add that to the label. But unfortunately, I've seen that product on its label lists bacterial diseases and other crops. And I've tried to get our growers, for example, our onion growers in central Washington, to not use that product to control bacterial diseases because I believe it exacerbates them. And so that's where some inside knowledge, um, being careful about interpreting those labels um, can be tough. Thank you. Yeah, um, we're also getting some some feedback about how your presentations are always so educational, including this one. So oh, thank you. I think Good. you've thank answered you. answered a lot of questions already. Um, so I'll end the poll. I always make them too long, so I apologize. <laughs> well, that's great, and we can, um, with Lindsay's permission, we will we can post this seminar so others can can go back and listen to it or um, watch it. 
Yeah. So I'll end the poll can, now. The other slides will be in there so people can look at the rest of them. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'll share the results of the quiz and um, it seems like you, you got some good messages across. So Lindsay, if you want to go through these questions. Okay, great. Here. So fungicides that are xylem translocated move up the plant. Correct. So 96% of you got it correct. Um, and the one person, I think maybe one or oh, two that indicated none of the above. When, when it comes to the example we used of trefloxystrobin that had that picture that said it's translaminar, it wasn't xylem translocated. So I can see why that might have been a little confusion around that. But I'm really pleased to see that most of you now know xylem translocation is one direction and that's up. Copper bactericides um, are protectant. Um, so they're not curative. Uh, they don't cure existing infection. They can actually make it worse with that example I showed on carrots. Um, they're not systemic, unfortunately. Um, they really are not. So that's, uh, I, are, I do see some labels that say this, but um, basically you need to treat coppers as if they're not systemic. They are protectant. Um, so th that is the correct answer. 84% of you got correct. Um, to reduce the risk of fungus developing resistance to fungicides, only apply fungicides from the same frac group. Unfortunately, that's not correct. That's the opposite of what you should do. You should definitely use fungicides from different frac groups because you want, you want to mix different active ingredients so you don't keep selecting for resistance with the same, same ingredient. Um, you definitely want to rotate, that's correct. You want to tank mix. You want to use fungicides at the maximum labeled rate. Um, so B and C are correct, but more correct is B, C, and D. So B, C, and D are all correct for reducing the risk of, of resistance developing in the pathogen to the products. 